What's going on guys? It's Nick here, back with another fantasy football video. This one's going to be a little bit different. We're testing something out with this one. So it's going to be a podcast style rankings discussion. We're going to be mainly talking about wide receivers, but a little bit of the news around Zeke um, and a little bit of just kind of like overall news. So, but it's mainly going to focus about wide receivers and it's going to be me, it's going to be Darren, and it's going to be Nick Ercolano from Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football channel. I'm sure a lot of you are subscribed to both of us and I kind of see in his videos that you guys are. If you aren't subscribed to him, I'll put in the description right at the top his YouTube channel, his Twitter, and he has a website as well. So I'll post all of that at the top of the description. So definitely check him out. Uh, so he's the other voice if you guys were confused who the other person is. But it's going to be a podcast now. We're testing this out also for the regular season because you guys want a podcast and maybe not be doing like waiver claims because that that would have to be out instantly so that's gonna be like an article on the website you guys can read but maybe do like an hour lot podcast with him and darren to kind of talk about trade targets to talk about streaming options talk a little bit of dfs i know that nick doesn't do that but i'm huge into dfs so i'll throw in like maybe a 10 minute segment or something like that but maybe once a week doing something like this for like an hour long thing so let me know if you guys want that after listening to this but without further ado, we're just going to hop right into it. I'm, I'm not as high as you are on him, mostly because the tale of two seasons narrative. But I can see he's kind of at that upper tier because a lot of the guys have a lot more question marks around there. But I think just on an upside basis, I think his ceiling was basically hit last year. I, I don't see him surpassing what he did last year. And I think there is a little bit more risk in him this year than there was last year. Well, I think, all right, so here's where the difference in our rankings come from. Right now, he's going off the board at, I think, wide receiver, like, 23, right? 23. You guys have him a little below that. I have him at 13. So I'm way higher on a lot of people. You're right. I think I've only seen, like, Evan Silva have him somewhat near where I have him. My thing is this. Like, you look at his PPR finishes, right? 2015, wide receiver 7. Last year, wide receiver 10. And I get the argument, the whole like tale of, of two halves where he does really well in the beginning, drops off at the end. But I was looking at the splits, and I'll send you guys this over so you can uh, throw it on the screen if you want. From weeks one to eight, in both years they had weeks one to eight, and then uh, a bye in week nine, and then he comes back, and then he's so dominant over that first stretch, right? He's elite. When he comes back, his points drop off, but they're not that far of a drop off. It's It goes from, I, most of my stuff is done on a half PPR basis. So he drops off from like 15 and a half, half point PPR down to like 10 and a half over the second half of the season. And while it's a big drop off, that 10 and a half points per game, if you kind of prorate that out to a full 16 games, it still lands him at wide receiver 20 or wide receiver 21. Where I see it is even if he performs as poorly as he did over the second half of last season or for the last two seasons he drops off if he does that for a full year you're still getting him exactly where he's being drafted and we've already seen the upside there right there's only a couple dudes in the league i think it's actually only Allen robinson who's been targeted inside the 10 yard line more than than fitz has over the last two years so you know you, you came into last year with not sure which cardinal to draft right it was like fitz michael floyd john brown they all had kind of like breakout appeal well, not fitz breakout but still value there now fitz is going into this year as like the clear cut number one floyd's out of the picture um john brown is already dealing with hamstring injuries again so we don't really know in, in my opinion i just feel like fitz is almost a guaranteed 10 targets a game and where he's being drafted is is basically his floor i mean that is true i think it's also with the john brown i've been like a john brown advocate mm -hmm. so if he does take a step forward into what he saw two years ago like the thousand and seven guy obviously fitz is going to take a hit if they're going to feed i mean david johnson's going to get his 25 touches a game regardless upside definitely is what he hit last year and maybe he can hit that again i just think it might be a stretch because palmer isn't getting younger either it's not even just fits yeah I, does palmer get hurt does palmer fall off yeah i can't argue with on the upside like the, there's no way he clears like a top eight or top ten ranking no. for wide receivers but my argument is like you can get him at, at pick 50 and the floor there i can i can't imagine him finishing outside of the top 24 wide receivers. So I think you're getting him out of floor. So if you know if you end up taking one of the more risky wide receivers in the in the first round, right? Like say you do take 
who's an injury? I don't know, like a Des Bryant, right? He's a little more risky yeah, than some Des guys. Julio, I guess. Yeah, or even some of the guys that you want to bounce, but like an A Rob or a Demarius Thomas, who are maybe not injury risk, but their upside is kind of risky. Yeah. You know, you could always pair them with a fits that you can get two rounds later. There, you have a floor and a ceiling, something like that. I just, I just really like fits as, as like a centerpiece of a team this year. Yeah. Actually, so you mentioned closer to Edelman than he is to like a Michael Thomas. I guess would be my ranking ones. Hmm. He's closer to that like slot guy that's like fine every week, but not, you know, the the AJ Greens, the Jordy Nelsons of the world. But I, I can definitely see your ranking. Mm-hmm. So, so you said Demarius Thomas. That's another player that we almost have flip flops between. We think Demarius Thomas and Larry Fitzgerald offer basically the same on a PPR point point five PPR, but you have him ranked several spots lower. And I would argue Demarius Thomas has the higher ceiling of the two. Like, what's changed really with Demarius this year? I guess is like he's going in the same situation, so I feel like he's not risky at all. I wouldn't say Demarius is risky, and that's a good point. I had someone comment on one of my uh, videos today saying, like, isn't Crabtree the same thing as Amari Cooper, uh, but two rounds later? And I was like, no, because Cooper has that huge upside. Where I, I would argue that Crabtree is almost the same thing as Demarius Thomas. Like, t- yeah. Thomas, you know you, what you're yeah, like, you you know, Thomas is, is kind of like the same Golden Tate thing, right? And he's going to give you 90 catches, 1,000 yards. But on a points per game basis, he's been declining, and he's usually finishing between wide receiver 18 and wide receiver 20. Over the last two years, he's finished in that range on a points per game basis. So it, in my eyes, I don't see him as as getting anywhere near the upside. I guess, you know, they, they have the same floor, but I would argue that Fitz has a higher upside based on his touchdown projection over the last over the last two years because yeah. Demarius is at what like 10 or 11 and uh, Fitz is just so heavily involved within the in the 10 yard line and by the goal line so I think Fitz has more touchdown upside and you know he did lead the league in, in catches last year he's been the team over the last few years so it's I don't know I, I see Emmanuel Sanders almost taking a step forward too in that offense yeah but I mean Demarius Thomas man I know he's had a couple down touchdown seasons but never been below 1k you know, at least in recent years, and mm-hmm. double-digit touchdowns besides the last two. That's um, also Manning, too. Like, we have to consider yeah. He doesn't have you, or, uh, Peyton Manning no, he did, anymore. he did really well with um, Tim Tebow was throwing him balls. Yeah. I just can't and see he was still a stud. 12. Like, there's no way he gets 12 touchdowns. With no, but I'm, I'm saying, um, as for touchdown upside, I don't think either one between Thomas or Fitzgerald has an, has an advantage over the other. I don't know. I, I feel like I feel like the Cardinals are a better offense overall. Like think of think of the makeup of the Broncos, right? They are they're like a hard nosed defensive team. They're gonna be looking to run the ball a lot. And I like Trevor Simeon leading them, they're not gonna they're not gonna be marching down the field whereas, you know, Palmer he obviously kinda took a step back last year, but he looked good over the second half of the season. And that offense is they were like their their kicker Kent what's his name Kent Zero or whatever Kent Zero yeah they were like three kicks away in the beginning of the season they threw away like three games in a row off of like three kicks so you, you flip the script there and they're they're like a playoff team they're a good team and you're looking at them as like a high kind of like a high powered offense with David Johnson and then you're like uh, oh you know what Fitch is the number one in a high powered offense that's kind of how I'm looking at it yeah I did pick them at the beginning of last season to be my sleeper team for the Super Bowl but then again the season before that I picked the Colts <laughs> and, and that that was the year they really sucked too. Who's your uh, sleeper for the Super Bowl this year? Sleeper for the Super Bowl? Yeah, mm. I took the Titans. I threw a hundred on them. The Titans? Yeah, that's not terrible. They're plus four thousand. Yeah, so you're getting the big Ooh, plus four thousand. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. super sleeper. Yes, sir. But they got a nice See, my, offense. My two would be, um, but they're not two sleepers. You know, um, playoff teams because you got Steelers, I think, and the Giants. Yeah, uh, those who realistically, I I think, have the only chance. The Giants. The Patriots I think the Giants better. You can't even pick an AFC team because the Patriots are just going to beat them. Just hope that the Patriots like pee their pants when they see the Giants again. Well, that's where the best value is, though, because everyone's like, yeah. "Nah, it's not going to happen." That's why you get forty to one on yeah. their return. But back to uh, Demarius yeah, Thomas. Guess, but I think the I think the argument there is not so much our rankings, but you know, like you have to draft Demarius Thomas two rounds ahead of where you're drafting Larry Fitzgerald. And I think that's my argument here. And I, yeah, and I rarely draft Demarius Thomas. Same. To go with that. Like even, like also people have to recognize that these are rankings and like he's not taking Larry Fitzgerald at 13th overall wide receiver because you don't have to. He, and we don't have to take 
guys where we have them ranked. It's just where where we like them. But you're not going to take a guy three rounds ahead of where you have him, where yeah. the ADP is, even though you have him ranked there. I wanted to ask you guys, what's your when you're ranking a guy like? What's what's your process? Is it like where do I think they're gonna finish, or where would I take them based on like the value? Because I feel like a lot of people, some people do projections and then go off their numbers. When I'm when I'm doing my rankings, straight up, I'm like I'll put the the guys in a list and I'll say like if I'm on the clock right now, who am I taking? Like if I have my yeah. straight up pick out of these guys, like who am I taking? Is that how you do it? Yeah. I don't even look at projections because like some guys have a fine end of season numbers and stuff and they can be projection wise pretty good but it's not even valuable having them on your team sometimes which is why like cooks I might bump down sometimes or not take them because mm -hmm. the end of the year he might be fine but that's because he has like monster games and then duds and I take that into consideration right like, that's not as valuable in the second round and I want that mm -hmm. even if he finishes as a second round pick like it wasn't actually that valuable yeah, but like some some uh, some like the experts, analysts or whatever on on like Twitter, they'll do their projections. They'll break it down so granularly to the point where it's like they go team by team projecting like pass attempts based on history, and then they break it down by player by player and shit like that, and they let the numbers like calculate all the fantasy points. I'm like, yeah. at what point does like, at what at what point can we like stop this shit? You know? Yeah. You have no but, idea what's gonna happen. Yeah. If you, years, if you saw so our rankings, off. you'd see that they're actually we don't filter by highest fantasy points scored in a season to the lowest and rank them that way either. Yeah. It's sprinkled, so we may have people that we have projected at lower fantasy points because we put projections for receiving yardage, rushing yardage, touch the touchdowns, mm -hmm. and they're not in order by highest to lowest no, at all. Definitely not. The like, guys like way back in the rankings that have a decent projection, mm -hmm. but that we just buried them because I, I just don't want them on my team, whether it's through risk or whether it's through week-to-week -week consistency. And I, th I think that's, um, I think when we look at our ranking comparisons, I think that's something when you take into considerations like ceiling and floors, right? If you're doing a projection, that's impossible to project into uh, actual numbers, right? And that's where I think maybe we differ with a guy like Tyrell Williams, right? Where I have him as 25 yeah. and you have him as 36. You know, you, you've heard a lot of buzz about him now with with the Mike Williams injury, Keenan Allen coming back. So people are like, he had a really good year last year. And what's the deal with him for 2017? Do we think he's going to break out? And I'm one of those guys that I, I thought he was awesome last year. I think he's going to be the number one outside threat for the Chargers in this upcoming season. And I think he's a real deal. So it's it's not me just like anyone can come out and say like I really like Terrell Williams this year, but it's more more so I guess me like putting my money where my mouth is on that ranking. Yeah, I think we're gonna move him up to a little bit. Mm -hmm. But like it's the worst that Mike Williams went out because I really don't think that changes much except for Same. Gonna, like changes ADP a ton. But he's still going at, at like pick 90, 95. So it's, it's gonna move up. Yep. It will. Yeah. How long do you expect that to last? Not much longer. People are really gonna be doing their drafts like next week. Crazy. And ESPN just changed their rankings like a few days ago, I think. Yeah. That. That's. I hate that too. How if you draft on like Yahoo or ESPN, their rankings and their ADPs are so messed up. <laughs> compared to normal shit and then and then they change them and then everyone starts drafting differently. I'm like, all right. So we did kind of golden tape. What about Diggs? We're very high on Diggs this year. You have them nine spots back. Yeah. Or we have them. Well, Diggs, I want to get back into golden tape too after. But okay, we can go back to him, yeah. Diggs, I think for me, it's more so just the offense as a whole and having Sam Bradford uh, as opposed to uh, Teddy Bridgewater under center, right? Like, we've seen the flashes of Diggs. Like, we know he's a great athlete, great player. He can make crazy plays that you're like, wow, this kid is, you know, he's the real deal. But in the same time, he doesn't get used at all inside the 10-yard line. His touchdown upside is, is super, super limited, right? And he finished, I think, inside the top 30 for PPR. He was wide receiver 30 last year. But he was wide receiver 43 in standard. So when when you take a look at that, like he would need to take a huge step forward if he wants to, I guess, break that top 25 or even that like top 20. And you see the switch of quarterback Bradford to Bridgewater like kills his yards per reception and yards per catch. It, I think it dropped from let me see the stats here 13.8 to 10.8. So three yards per difference in in yards per reception because you know Teddy Bridgewater is a better thrower I'd argue than Sam Bradford who. His highest completion percentage ever in the NFL. It's fantastic, but his depth per target was like the lowest in the NFL. So I don't know. I'm just off him as a whole, just not being utilized in the red zone that much, and just not not a lot of deep shots down the field. The reason no, you don't like him is the reasons we like him, though, too. 
Really? Like you said, in standard, we would never suggest to draft them in standard. Mm-hmm. But those low throws, these slot receivers, that's where the money's at in PPR. Yeah, and that's their whole offense. Is like you're not he's not gonna catch these monster touchdowns deep. It's because their whole offense is just that short passing game. And they're gonna use Rudolph in the red zone, so he's not gonna have many touchdowns, but I mean if he can get like five or six with ninety to hundred catches, I mean he's in that golden tate range being drafted a round or two after Golden Tate. I know you don't like Golden Tate either, but and also yours are half point and ours are full point. Yeah. So ours are gonna like be weighted a little bit more towards the receptions. Right, right. I just think like he's so young and he's still developing. They're like I think he was thirteenth, I wanna say, in points per game because he missed like he missed three full games, I think, but then Yeah, that's another games. issue. He he's he's played in thirteen games last year, thirteen games in uh in two thousand fifteen as well. So I mean his points per game are definitely there, but it's. I think that's another thing to take into consideration. Is he's he's had like groin, ankle, knee, like very, a lot of soft tissue. Everything kind of thing. he can list. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just name it. Name it. He's there. But I kind of like those guys though. Like I'd rather have someone like that. Like obviously, I'm not comparing him to Frank Gore. Mm-hmm. But like someone like Frank Gore that at the end of the season might finish spots ahead of him, but it's because they played every game. And it's not like I'm taking a zero for the games he's out. Right. Like I can still fill someone in. Yep. So I'd rather have the guy that only plays 13, but on a points per game basis was a one, mm-hmm. versus someone who played all of them but was a little bit less successful in those games. Yeah, I just think the consistency is a big thing for me too. Like you know, he has his on games, but he ha- he'll have he'll give you so many dud games. Like I'm just looking at the does, yeah. the lineup. It's four for 40, five for 47, two for 18, two for 13, three for like a lot of games like that. So it's like you're not taking a zero on it. Sorry, I gotta shut my oven off real quick. <laughs> Oh, it's all good. My dryer's been going off. We all know about that. Yeah, I've never recorded it. <laughs> because he does have those games that are like six for for seventy or you know five for five for eighty, but those are pretty money in PPR. You're happy with that performance. He does. He does. And, he does. and your wide receiver three three spot, it's not a big deal. But I think a person who does more is going to be Golden Tate last year. I, I'm a little bit on the lower end of Golden Tate because I don't see him as safe as Diggs. I'm not saying that um, he's not the same type of player because they both play from this slot, but I think when it comes to just going completely cold, I think Tate has more of those traits in him than Stefan Diggs does. Oh, absolutely. Your your uh, subscribers are going to be like, what the, what the fuck does this kid do all day? But I was putting together a little chart I'll send you guys over. So I was looking at last year and I looked at this year and I wanted to go through like week by week because like you said, Golden Tate's hot and he's cold, right? He, he'll put up those dud games for you without a doubt. So I was looking at a weekly PPR ranking. So I went full PPR on this and I looked at how many games he's finished outside of the top 30, outside of the top 40, things like that. So last season he finished outside of the top 24. So he wasn't a wide receiver too in 11 games. So you look back at 2015, and it was the same thing, 11 games outside of the top uh, 24. And it's 10 games outside of the top 30. So if you're in a 10 team league, he's not, he's giving you wide receiver four or worse numbers in 63% of your games over the last two years. It's like, sure, he, he has, like last year he finished inside the top 10 five separate times. And those are the weeks, you know, that, that are great because those are the numbers that pad his stats at the end of the year. He has those crazy, crazy numbers and you're like, oh, Golden Tate, so safe, 90 catches every year. But in reality, he gives you like eight to 10 weeks that you can't even use. You know what I mean? Those are the trickiest players to kind of project. Well, he was on waivers last year after they were talking about benching him when he dropped that final pass. Oh, yeah. And then it it felt like once they threatened him with that, he just turned it up. So, I mean, coming into this, if if it would have been the start of the season and we had hot Golden Tate, and then we towards the end of the season, he finished off ice cold like he started last season, I don't think he would even have his draft value right now. Yeah, I think a, that people point. are really banking that he's going to build off of what he did at the end of last season. Because if it was the other way around, people would just say he's done. He's not part of the offense. He's not working well with Matthew Stafford. Yeah. So, but I, I see it as the season as a whole. I don't see that season as such a great season. Yeah, I hear you. I'm, I'm the same way. Because looking back at the two years, it's, it's a big sample size of going hot and cold. And he finished, uh, in the last five weeks of the season, he finished in the top ten three times. So you're like, wow, you know, he ended off really strong. But... What's your uh, your thoughts on you know Anquan Bolden leaving now? So maybe Tate's never really been like that effective inside, like inside the ten yard line or whatnot. But think that plays any role? I think mean, he just goes to Ebron. Yeah. I mean, he's gonna get some more, but 
it probably just goes Ebron and Marvin Jones, benefactor of that. Yeah. A lot of people classify Jones right now as just the deep threat guy, and he's he is really good at that. But if you remember on the Bengals, was it what his rookie or sophomore season before he tore his ACL? He had ten, he had double digit touchdowns coming in at ten with only like eight hundred yards. He's kind of like a Dante Moncrief style of player where not not to that extent where one in every six catches was a touchdown but he would be used like within the 20 yard line commonly because you know he's pretty tall and he's got those lanky arms so he's pretty good at that that's a good point now i like um, coming into last year i loved marvin jones he was like i was so sure he was gonna break out and then he had those like first four weeks where he put up like one he, he, yeah, he was like a top three wide receiver, and I'm like, yo, let's go. Like, I caught, like, the year before that, I was all over Allen Robinson, and then the last year, I was all over Marvin Jones, and I was like, two for two, like, we're getting it, and then he just, like, fell off the face of the earth, but I agree, man. He's going out, like, wide receiver 50, right, and he's he's a good bet to see 100 targets again this year, so it's someone that you can get really late in your draft. That, yeah, he's going way too late, regardless of if you think he's going to improve or not. Exactly, and, you know, the parts of the field that he excels on are, the, are those deep passes, and they don't really have, I mean, they have this kid, Kenny Galladay, the rookie coming in, who supposedly, everyone's, like, raving about him at camp. He looks like a really good yeah, red right. zone goal line. Talk. Yeah, I'm, it's one of those, like, I'll see it when I, I'll believe it when I see it kind of yeah, thing. it's just but, camp talk. Exactly. He's a rookie, so. So Marvin Jones, yeah. I mean, he's big possession receiver and can beat guys down the field. So I think he's, he's pretty super undervalued this year as well. Would you draft uh, Kelvin Benjamin right now? Yes, absolutely. I was on him good. before. I know he had that. He looked pretty good. Uh, was it yesterday when they had the preseason yeah, game? Yeah. I mean, he's going to go up like half a round just from the touchdown. It like it doesn't, what, it, what doesn't make sense to me is kind of, you know, he's like there's no one else on the outside there. Like, even if you think... Devin Funches was terrible last year, right? So... He was bad, yeah. <laughs> like he's... Kel, Kelvin Benjamin's the, the clear number one target, like outside target in this offense. So, regardless of if you think he sucks, if you think he's fat and out of shape, you think he... You know, whatever it is, he's getting the targets there. He's going to get a ton of goal line looks. They're going to throw the ball up to him. And we know... You know, we've seen Cam's potential at quarterback. We see what he could do as... As obviously both a passer and a rusher, but if you're going to be the number one wideout on any team, let alone a team that has a ton of offensive potential, like I'll take him where he's going right now as like wide receiver. What is it like 26, 28 or something? Yeah, 26. Yeah, exactly. So he's going in like the it's like the fifth, the late fifth round. Right. So and that's the thing. It's like whenever I have the choice of picking Kelvin Benjamin, I'm never in a spot where I'm looking at my other options and feel like, oh, Calvin yeah. Benjamin's the best Because one. that's where yeah. Diggs and Sneed and Crowder are. Yep. And exactly. that's just, I take them every single time over him. All that's right. always the pick. It's Diggs, Sneed, Crowder, or Benjamin. In standard, though, I might actually in standard, consider taking lot, uh, okay. Benjamin for sure over them, especially after he made it look easy the other night. Yeah. yeah it's in standard, it's a lot closer. Yeah, for sure. Um Actually, since you guys touched on that, you had just had Diggs, Crowder, Sneed. I want to talk about Crowder and Sneed because I know, for me personally, when I get to that that area, those two are guys that I've had trouble deciding between and trouble on my, you know, like coming into the season, I was banking on both of them kind of having a breakout year, and uh, now we're hearing there's reports of you know Teddy Ginn is the number two on their depth yeah, chart. Right. And, and all that stuff. So is there, for you, who's the play there for you? I tend to lean, the hamstring injury has played some of it. I know Crowder has a hamstring injury right now and he should be fine. Mm -hmm. But for standard, I'm definitely leaning Sneed because the touchdown projection is higher for him just in the offense. But it's really close in PPR, but I'm still leaning Sneed right now mm. in drafts. Me, yeah, I take digs. Um, but it is really close. We actually put this uh, up to vote in the Facebook group, or, or someone did. And there was, you know, 30, 40 responses, and it was so split three ways. Really? Yeah, what was, about, what about between Crowder, between just Crowder and Sneed? Who do you have? I still Sneed. I lean Sneed. Sneed yeah. yeah. Okay. I, Maybe I, if it's injury, I don't know. I think I go the opposite way there. I think I would go um, Crowder over Sneed only because not not I don't actually like buy into the whole Teddy Ginn is the number two, but I think where the potential like Sneed ceiling. A big part of that was going to be able to take over like the main deep threat on that team. Not that I don't think he can he can do it again and make those long passes, but obviously Ginn's going to be pretty heavily involved on those. You know, he's in the dome now. He could still fly. So I think he takes a good amount of those. What I like more about Crowder is, you know, he is dealing with the injury, but he also has two guys that are supposed to take away targets that 
there's a good chance that at any point in the season, either Josh Doxson or Jordan Reed is going to be out. You know what I mean? Like 100% chance. Yeah, so Crowder, like, already building on last year, uh, 100 targets. Obviously, they lose Deshaun Jackson, Pierre Garçon, so that's like a million targets left, especially with Garçon kind of over the middle and things like that. And he's supposed to be the starter in two wide receiver sets. So opposite prior, I, I feel like Crowder can really hit that like 80, 85 catch mark. And if, you know, Doxson or Reed is, is hurting, then those targets should only go up. So I'm, I'm leaning Crowder right now also because I love Kirk Cousins. But um, but I think it's, I, I don't know, I love both of them this year. It's hard to decide. Yeah. I, the good news, I think, is you get Snead a little cheaper anyway. So normally you wouldn't have to be forced in that position. True. And, I mean, I'm trying to get them both. And like, it's been PPR mock drafts. Like that's what I'm targeting fifth, sixth round. And I'm just hoping I can get that because I want to lean running back early same i've been finding that like if you can grab a couple of running backs early the middle rounds at wide receiver the value there is just so much better than at running back just the difference i mean the difference when you're looking at like taking an elite running back and then how your team follows out with like the middle round wide receivers you're like oh i'm fine with those guys but if you take an elite wide receiver and then you look at the mid-round running backs it's like there's so many question marks yeah and you're just just not as comfortable with your team even with the elite wide receiver let me ask you something let's oh well, first let's let's get into the uh all the breaking news and shit that went on today uh and we're not going to talk about zeke too in depth but what do you think about this like i know for the most part you know six games is a lot of games and i i probably am not going to be reaching past the uh the fourth round like early fourth round is probably where i would debate taking zeke I'm not sure where you guys stand on that. I didn't get to watch the video, but what do you think about, like, say you're the one or two pick, right? And uh, you get David Johnson, Le'Veon Bell. Then when it wraps back around, when you're at 19, 20, 21, 22, and Zeke is there, like, what are your, I, I, that's, I know it's a pretty big that's reach. That's exactly but... what I said. Oh, really? <laughs> exactly. Like I said, what if you get DJ at the wraparound at the third, you can have DJ and Zeke with an elite wide receiver yep. for your championship. Done that, deal. That's what I that's was saying, too. all you have too. to do is make playoffs. That's was, why I consider him in the early third. Yeah. Six, six games is a lot, though. Playoffs. Six games six is, is a, lot. a lot. Ten weeks in the fantasy season. It's week eight before you get him. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's a seven, lot, though. It's going to be hard to survive. But, I mean, you've ran the numbers, you know. Third round picks potentially bust if you're on that wraparound and you're getting DJ. You more than likely have back to back picks or something. And half close. of the first two round running backs bust anyways. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of the game. That's, that's what I was thinking. I, I was like, I, I didn't even in, in my video I was saying that like if you get one, you know, the one or two, it'd be cool to have Zeke. Like that's that's gonna be really hard to resist if I have the one or two pick in yeah. my draft and I can get two of those guys. But then I was saying like I, realistically, I don't know if I can't pair Zeke with one of those guys. I don't know if I want to be taking him in from like 23 to 28. I, I, it's a weird strategy I have in my head, but I don't know if I'd reach before the fourth round mm-hmm. unless I can get him with Bell or Johnson. Because it wouldn't be ideal to pair him with like someone, like who, who's like someone who might not be as strong. Yeah, exactly. Like you don't want to pair him with Evans, mm-hmm. even though that'd be more of that end up being either a mid second or a mid third. It's like you do actually want Zeke or Bell. Other than that, you're loaded for the playoffs if you get those. Because you need your RB spot. That's what matters, isn't it? Exactly. If you're picking Zeke, you're obviously expecting to make the playoffs. And since you're expecting to make the playoffs, you're realistically, you know, you're missing him for six games, but you would also be having him for eight or nine, depending on how long your playoffs are. And you're not taking a zero. That's always how I think about it. Yeah, and there's there's plenty of replacements. I was in my video. There was uh, Jaquiz Rogers, Terrence West, yeah. maybe I mean, Rob, McFadden. Yeah, but McFadden, Rob Kelly. Well, the, if McFadden's ADP is going to shoot up too much. Those other guys are to the fifth or sixth, and you yeah. can't take him at that point. No way. I said, uh, probably, where would you put him, McFadden, if he's the two? If we assume that he actually gets the um, two, I'm assuming he's the two, and I said I would start looking at him when it hits the seventh round. Yeah, Ooh. if you have Zeke, obviously not if you don't have Zeke. Yeah, no, I wouldn't because I mean. And you're getting six games out of someone who's likely going to get about 18 touches, 15 to 18 mm-hmm. touches. So, I mean, as an RB2, that's fine, but you literally can't use him over the second half. So, exactly, you're just playing for some regular season wins. Whereas, like, Jaquiz, like, at least there's a chance he stays the starter. Yeah, like... So, if you pick Jaquiz and Zeke, you got three games wrapped up, and then maybe you find someone on waivers. But you can still start, like, in a PPR league, at least, you can still start, like, a... Alvin Kamara or Procise or something just get you some points right waiting and Zeke even in like uh, those guys like the quizzes and, and Terrence West and Rob Kelly like even if you don't you can expect them to be at least getting a starting load for the first few weeks and I was looking at the all three of them have like cupcake schedules to start the season they have like I think quiz has three bottom 10 defenses in rush and then the other two have five of six of their top 
Um, their first six games are like bottom half of the defense uh, rush wise in the NFL. So it's like you can weather the storm pretty well. So I mean, just if you're going to grab Zeke, then just make sure you maybe leap one or two rounds ADP wise to grab a guy that you are going to have replacing him. You know, you need one of them. Yeah, and yeah. you got to reach too. Yeah, exactly. You but can't, like try and get value. But we'll go back to McFadden though. Saying okay. those first six games, is he a back end RB one? No. Same to say because his well, schedule is pretty a crap. Schedule. Yeah, his schedule is for me. Crap, so I don't know if you can rely on that. So that's going to play a factor on if you're going to draft him. It. He's got round. Broncos and Giants. I'm pretty sure early on. It's it's Giants, Broncos, Cardinals. It's I, it was four out of the top four out of the first six games are like really tough, and that wasn't yeah. even Denver because Denver's like middle of the pack rush. But there's four. Four of the six, besides Denver, are, are real tough rush defenses. O-line takes a hit. Good. I was looking at, like, the goal line rushes, right? You look back at 2014, you got DeMarco Murray. Uh, you look back at Zeke last year. They both got around uh, between, like, 10 and 12 rushes on the goal line, and they scored, like, 13 to 15 touchdowns, rushing touchdowns. Then you look at McFadden, you know, how he was, like, the starter over the second half of last year, right, like 2015, and he got basically half the amount of goal line touches that – that those guys got, but he only scored two rushing touchdowns. And I think that kind of speaks to like the talent level of DeMarco and to uh, Zeke, right? Because those are guys that could break out for the 15, 20, 25, 30 yard touchdowns. When I don't know if like McFadden has that in him. So I can't imagine him putting up like those big of numbers. And plus when they used him, you gotta think of like, remember, uh, you remember two years ago when we were coming into the season, the big debate was like Joseph Randall versus Darren McFadden. And Randall won yes. that. Had he not been like a psycho and went like shoplifting and shit, he <laughs> might have been the running back for the rest of the year. Yeah, McFadden was good for a year on the Raiders, I want to say. Mm -hmm. And then he had the one good year with the Cowboys. But he's not He's not Zeke. He's not Mc, uh, Murray. Yeah. So, can he really excel against these elite defenses they're going to play? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to draft him, basically. Yeah, McFadden won't end up on my team either. Watkins. Watkins, Watkins over to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. He just runs through it. Like, yeah. Watkins or Pryor? Watkins or Pryor. Oh, I think I just flipped them in my... Uh, I have them. I had Watkins 15, Pryor 16, and then when this move was made, I flipped them. So I have Pryor 15, Watkins 16 now. Yeah, I moved Watkins behind Pryor, and then it would be... Because we actually had Watkins in a tier ahead of Pryor. We, uh, yeah, and I, I draw but, it back. Yeah, yep, me too. Not same tier anymore. Because that I'm tier has to have upside to wide, oh, top five wide receiver. Exactly and I don't I think did. Watkins has top five wide receiver upside on a team like the Rams. No, he doesn't. Gosh. To be Alshon, then Keenan Allen, then Watkins. But I moved him behind Pryor, Allen Robinson, Devonta Adams, Landry, and Crabtree. I just tanked him because I don't want any part of of Jared Goff. Yeah, I don't and all those guys. You know what it is? You know what I think my biggest lesson I learned last year? I was like real in on the zero RB strategy and I came out the gates with like a ton of Allen Robinson, Brandon Marshall, Sammy Watkins, uh, those kind of like a lot of stock in those dudes and I looked at the rankings at the end of the year and you look at every top wide receiver, like all 10 of them, top 10 receivers last year, all of them have really good, if not great quarterbacks. Antonio okay. Brown, Julio, AJ Green, Jordy Nelson, Michael Thomas, right? All like elite, elite guys. I think that's like super important when you're, if for as like a tiebreaker, right? If you're gonna go between two different guys, I think having the quarterback there, not to say like elite guys, of course, like Robinson, Hopkins can have those breakout years, but I think if you're looking for consistency at elite level, you can't look any further than the quarterback. No, you, he's not going to be consistent with Jared Goff when he wasn't consistent. I mean, he was like sort of consistent when he was healthy, but he was never healthy, so we can never really say. If he's not posting consistent numbers with Tyrod, who I think is a good quarterback, mm -hmm. he's not going to do it with Goff, who's pathetic. I don't want to like jump the gun on Goff because I feel like we we have no. He had a terrible run block, a terrible line, and they get Adam Whitworth or, or Andrew Whitworth. Yeah, they got Whitworth, that. So. They got that. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, Watkins, like, where he excels is really down the field. You know, he, he's very good at catching them deep balls, and that was, like, a, a strength of tie rods, too. So, them two connected well, and I can't imagine it being anything like they had there. But at the same time, I mean, you look at, you know, Kenny Britt put up usable numbers last year, um, 68 for, like, 1,005 touchdowns. So, you could slide Watkins in there if not if not more. Is yeah. there anything to be made of this reuniting... Sammy Watkins and Robert Woods. I know you're a big consistency guy over there. Uh, that's funny. I actually looked up at the splits, too. I was like, it's such a small sample games of Sammy with and without Robert Woods, and there was almost no difference there. But, I mean, eh, I, I don't know. I can't imagine 
And Watkins, will, we'll just say Watkins will enjoy his lifestyle. He's got a friend there already. He'll be in LA as opposed to Buffalo. But fantasy football, I can't imagine that uh, that making a difference. Would you draft Woods with like a last round pick? No, I yeah. <laughs> I don't think I would have drafted Woods prior to this. I liked Cooper yeah. Cup a lot more. Better football move for Woods because he's he was not going to be a good one. Oh, absolutely. He's a slot guy. You can't touch him in fantasy. Like no way on that offense. They um, scored like fifteen a game. Or Thirteen a game. Yeah, yeah, it was literally like two touchdowns, and I was, I was, I love this kid, uh, Cooper Cup. He was like one, in my one of my first videos this off season, like back in March when the draft just happened. I was like, Cooper Cup's going to lead this team in in receptions and targets, like, no okay. doubt. Yeah, now I'm like, God damn it. So Cup's out. Woods, yeah, I'm not touching. But great front office move by them, right? Sign Woods like a thirty five million dollar contract, and then just bring someone else that's way better in. Like, okay. Yeah, it's his I last year of his contract, too. What about Jordan Matthews is on the Bills now? Yeah, so Jordan Matthews comes the weirdest move. The Bills. He's basically like the who, slot. Who is going to play the Is now. he going to play the slot, though? Because now they got Bolden. They got Zay Jones. Yeah. Like, like who plays the slot there now? It's, well, it's, uh, You know? I got slot players. I got to think it's Matthews. Like, Bolden, he's got to be the one. Like, Bolden? who else would play the one? I don't want Jordan Matthews playing the one. I like Zay Jones a lot. For me, this this boosts up Zay Jones a lot on my uh, on my board. I think he's like a super athletic player. The targets were going to be there prior to Bolden coming in, and now that Sammy Watkins is gone, I think it wouldn't surprise me to see Zay Jones end up with more targets than um, than Anquan Bolden. Maybe not maybe not more meaningful targets like down by the by the goal line, but Zay Jones is a guy you can uh, throw a lot of quick hitting passes to. He. he, he no, he excels on the screenplay really well. So that's a tough group of those three to kind of block up. But I think in terms of fantasy, I, I can't touch Bolden because he, he basically has no upside. No. Much better no. real-life player than fantasy. I guess you'd have to go with Jordan Matthews as as the guy in Buffalo, right? I wouldn't. Yeah. Fantasy-wise? I wouldn't touch any of them, to be no, honest I with think you. they all just vulture each other. Like, Bolden vultures touchdowns, and then Zay Jones and Matthews just both are fine. Like, yeah. they both get catches. But neither of them are going to be like, neither of them, no one's going to be a two. No. There's no way any of them get a two. So then you're looking at three. It's like maybe one of them's a low end three, but point, I'm just going to pass and take someone else. Yeah, I think this I think this helps uh, Sean McCoy a little bit. He's definitely catching about 70 balls this year now. I mean, if they don't run him on every play, then <laughs> True. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> they got to keep him fresh. But I think Tyrod's going to find himself have, in a much more comfortable situation. Tyrod, um, it was interesting because I was looking at splits also between Tyrod with and without Sammy, and uh, it's not that big of a drop off. And it's it's obviously because his passing goes down without Sammy, but his rushing attempts yeah, and rushing, his rushing though, yards go way back up. But as as a as a fantasy quarterback like Tyrod, you'd like to have someone with at least like a good passing floor. So he becomes a little bit too risky now for me. I like Tyrod as a big sleeper last year and this year, but I think without Sammy, it kind of uh, it scares me away a lot more. Yeah, I think there's takes- enough weapons though. I think there's enough weapons to kind of change it to more of a short passing game style. Because, I mean, Clay, that's another name out there that's also on that team. Similar skill set as all of the rest of them. God, I hate so I think as long as he can get the ball in the open receiver's hands, if he can do that, he shouldn't see any decrease in yardage. But I also, like, to be honest, would you rather him, like, hit a target for five yards or just scramble for five? Like, it's more points when he scrambles. Yeah, of course. So yeah. I would prefer to sure. have mediocre options and then have 600 rushing yards. Yeah. As opposed to hitting the guys, maybe gaining three, four hundred passing yards, but the rushing numbers go down. True yeah. that. I like him still. We still have him ranked. I don't remember where we have him ranked. He's higher than most people have him. We have him. Yeah, I had Tyrod. Rod- low end two. I, or a high end two. That's what we got. Same. I think I had him at like 13 or 12, maybe. In, in that range. Yeah, he'll probably he's drop. He's going like 17th, and he'll go like probably 19th now. Oh yeah, he's gonna drop way off the board. Imagine getting 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 him in a two quarterback league as your second quarterback. Oh boy, that's phenomenal. Hey, so real quick though, I know we talked about the news, but I did want to mention one player, Jarvis Landry. Your rankings? I don't think we've um, made the decision yet on if Cutler is necessarily going to impact Landry in a negative way or not. But I can see. I think you already made that distinction right away. Yeah. So here's my uh, here's my take on this. When I heard the Cutler news, I started looking into the outlooks for the rest of the players. And really what I came to was it doesn't affect almost anyone on the outside. And I don't think it affects um, Ajayi at all. I think it flips the scripts on Julius Thomas and Jarvis Landry's outlooks because 
you know, uh, we have that small sample size of Gase and Cutler together back in 2015 with Chicago. And then and Cutler as a quarterback on his own. I was looking at how he like operates and who he throws his targets to. And it was always like, you know, that combination of Brandon Marshall, Alshon Jeffrey, Martellus Bennett, and then even Zach Miller in 2015. Very heavy utilizing the outside guys, very heavy on the tight end. The, the best uh, season out of a slot receiver that Cutler had over the last like four or five years was, I think it was Earl Bennett back in like 2012. He caught like 30 passes for 300 yards and two touchdowns. And, you know, with Cutler, he's got that like, you know, fuck it and chuck it kind of attitude. So rather than, I, he's not a guy that I see just dumping off balls to Jarvis Landry. And the Dolphins, you know, they've just been kind of moving away from that game plan. They want to run the ball more. Um, Adam Gase and Cutler going back to 2015, 2016, both teams ranked very high percentages in like rush attempts or percentage of plays that are, are runs. And I think if you look over the second half of last season or when whenever JJ took over as that workhorse, I think it was like week six or seven, you see how many touches he gets and you see Jarvis Landry's targets, uh, receptions, all those numbers really, really dip down. And not that he really had any upside near the end zone, but Julius Thomas coming in definitely does not help him there. That's kind of my overall take. I just, I think Cutler doesn't utilize the, the slot receiver enough. You don't think Eddie Royal back in Denver was a, kind of a good analogy for how I do? Because I think Eddie Royal hit 1K. If not, he came pretty damn close. Um, mm. So that's the only reference I have. So we kind of took the mindset, we're going to wait and see. We haven't done Just because Landry's been so money for PPR lately, we can't just automatically discredit him. And I know you obviously would still take him, but um, I don't think where he's at in drafts is ever going to fall to you based on where you have him ranked. Yeah, I won't get... He's a guy that I've um, probably mistakenly never really had in my uh, in my drafts because, you know, I'm not, I'm not... I'm just not a guy that really likes the safe floor PPR play, especially guys that don't have any, like, touchdown upside. And I wanted to kind of pull up these numbers, I guess, for you guys. Were you saying Eddie Royal as uh Jay Cutler, I think. Jake, that was back with Cutler. Oh, geez. Okay, so I'm looking at... Now, he had 980 yards, but that was... Uh, that was his rookie year in 2008. So that was a long, long time ago. I see it was saying. a long time ago. That could be. Uh, don't get me wrong. Yeah, that could be a. Uh, you know, maybe Jay Cutler's like rookie. You, you rely on those short passes. You rely on like those over the middle kind of dump off passes. That's very possible. I have no idea who the who the other weapons on that team were. Um, but I think they have enough talent on the outside with Parker and um, or Stills, JJ, Julius Thomas that I can't see Landry's usage being so high. I also saw a really uh, another like uh, interesting take. I want to hear what your guys' thoughts on this were. You know how when Adam Gase was in Denver with like Demarius Thomas, Peyton Manning, they were absolutely like steamrolling teams. Demarius Thomas put up incredible numbers, and a lot of it came off those screen passes that he uh, that he took 80, 60, 80 yards. It'd be behind the line of scrimmage, take it 60, 80 yards. And uh, someone tweeted out today that I think in the first preseason game, Jay Cutler. Uh, or Parker had one target from Cutler, and people are—they're basically saying that like maybe Devonte Parker is being set up as the same way Demarius Thomas was in that Adam Gase offense a couple of years ago. You know, screens. Him and him and uh, Thomas are both very long, right? They both have like four four to four four five. 40 yard speed so you could utilize Parker on those screens and, and maybe he could blow past the defense so I thought it was an interesting take that I hadn't heard before yeah I mean typically color just picks someone and just feeds them yeah. like no matter how the coverage is he's throwing the ball to them so it's possible that they do that and I mean he was drafted in the first round he like he is an elite receiver it's always just been has he been trying to be in like the offseason and everything so we have to I want to see in the preseason how they utilize him and what the connection are and like what the reports are from training camp mm -hmm. but he's definitely got the upside to do that like he's a really good receiver it's just who does color pick like we just have to guess who his favorite target is going to be I don't think it's as much slot versus number one yeah. I just think in practice it's who he prefers to throw the ball to that's who we want in fantasy yeah. So we just have to figure out who that guy is. Jarvis has the better hands, so could go his way, but we don't know. We we have Parker ranked about the same, and I think we both have the same mindset that his upside is looking a little brighter with Cutler there. Yeah. But I did want to actually ask you about rookies. Can we talk about rookies real quick? Sure. So I have a strong feeling, and I, and I may be different from Nick here on this, but I don't think there's going to be one rookie that hits 1,000 yards this year. I just don't. I don't see a situation that's presents itself um, so easily to any of these rookies. 
I think that we've gotten comfortable with the thousand yard rookie trend that's been happening recently, but people are starting to forget how difficult that achievement actually is. And I just don't see the upside in some of these receivers actually with a reasonable projection to get it. I mean, who even has a chance to? I don't really know of anyone who could possibly do that. Corey Davis was definitely my top rookie, but I think I have him ranked as like wide receiver 48. And uh, depending on how this hamstring stuff kind of goes, he's probably going to get knocked out of there soon. Yeah, I don't see any of them. None of them are in great positions. It's not like someone's coming on in and filling a role on, on a great a great offense that has tons of opportunity. And yeah, we've gotten spoiled the last few years with these rookie wide receivers. And you look at the guys who went over a thousand yards, right? It's like Mike Evans and, and Odell Beckham and stuff. And it's like, clearly, you know, we don't have that kind of talent in the draft. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of any of the uh, any of the rookie wide receivers that we're really seeing. No, it would have only been Davis. And I think we dropped him to 53. Mm -hmm. So there's there's just no way. We, if, unless everyone dies around him. <laughs> Like, I guess if Decker and Matthews get hurt, maybe. But other than that scenario, there's no way. They're going to run the ball so much. Who do you like out of those three? no way. Fantasy. Who do you like out of the Tennessee receivers? I just Decker. That's all I'd tell you. Decker, same here. Yeah? I might. I mean, if anything happens, I, I I'll keep my eye on Richard Matthews. If there's no good options, I don't know, maybe everyone goes into the draft with the same targets as me. Richard Matthews isn't a guy I'm totally going to count out. But the passing volume on that team is just so minimal. So I, I really can't get behind it. I have to bank on the efficiency in the red zone, and that's Screams Decker. Yeah, they're both hyper-efficient. Like, Mariota and Decker are both, like, elite red zone players. Yeah. So you put them together, I mean, even if he's only at 800 yards, he could be at the double-digit touchdown range, which would make him worth it as draft position. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I was going to say, it's it's. I feel like it's almost a sure bet that Decker leads everyone in, in receptions and probably touchdowns. I, uh, I'm i a fan of Rashard Matthews. I think if Corey Davis, like, I mean, it's a big if, you know, we still have to wait on this news a lot um, for the hamstring, but, dude, I'm high on Rashard Matthews. I feel like he's getting very, very underrated. Like, he was a top 12 wide receiver last year. And I know, like, he would have been, I would have been super high on him if they didn't go after Corey Davis. But, you know, you look at, like, especially over the second half last year, I think he had, out of, like, the eight or nine, or even, like, ten final games, he was at a touchdown or 100 yards and I think, like, nine out of the ten games. So, like, stupidly high efficiency, which I get what you're saying. Like, the regression is definitely coming, and especially with Davis. But just, I, I think if Davis misses time, it, Matthews is being super underrated there. And, I mean, he made the predicting a top five video we did. Like, I, I, didn't, I was That's shocked. True. Like, we went through, mm -hmm. or I went through, like, all the stats from everyone. I tried to make a model to predict top five with, like, high accuracy. And then afterwards, I looked at who made the list. And it was all the guys you'd think. And then there was just, like, there was him. Just chilling there at the end. I was like, ah, so maybe, maybe it's possible. Yeah. I just think he needs injuries. Like, there's no way that everyone stays healthy and he does. He needs injuries. Yeah, he needs the opportunity. And it goes back to the Dolphins, too. I was looking, it was like, at Miami, he never really got the chance, but he had six games where he saw six targets or more. And in every one of those games, he saw he had uh, 85 yards or a touchdown. And then that translated over to Tennessee. So it's like, at what point do you have a guy with great measurables? and now has done it, given the opportunity, you know, and can produce. Like, at what point are you just like, wow, maybe this guy's actually really good, right? And maybe it's just us saying that Decker's the one. Yeah. Like, has that, that even been announced? No. Like, for sure that Matthews isn't the one right now? Reports that their connection was really good, but, I mean, they're just going to be playing different roles. So you're not going to know who's going to end up getting the more targets by the end of the season. To your point of how Tennessee is going to run the ball a ton, I think uh, a low-key like move that happened this offseason was losing Anthony Fasano. He's a great he's a great pass blocking tight end, right? And they they ran two tight end sets all the time. So they could rush it more. Now they have these three stud wide receivers and they just have kind of Delaney Walker there to play the tight end. So I feel like they're gonna be running a lot more three wide receiver sets. Goes without saying and, and thus you kinda of see Mariota take a pretty big uptick in in passing, in volume, I think. Yeah, okay. And, yeah. But they are an insanely good offensive line too. Yeah. And with two insanely good running backs. Yep. So regardless of that's why you who bet the on them. Are, they're gonna pound the rock. That's why you bet on them to win the Super Bowl because everyone's just so good. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Four thousand. Like, why not at that point? Yeah. Well, Delaney Walker should be taking a hit because this yeah. is that too many mouths to feed scenario on already what is a low passing volume offense. 
So I, I especially based off ADP, I'm not going to be having any shares of Delaney Walker. Yeah, he took the biggest hit for me too. Because I mean, Decker coming in there, that's going to take away a ton of the you know production that that Walker had over the middle and whatnot. Hurts had to have been behind him in our rankings, but it's possible he's ahead of him now. Like now that Matthews is gone. Hertz has to get more targets. I totally forgot about that. I got to update my uh, Philly rankings, Ooh. probably. Yeah, I mean, I don't even look at our tight end usually, to be honest, because like, nothing ever changes. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. Aguilar, what do you think? Super oh, sleeper, dude. fourteen team leagues. Stop it. He'll be he'll be drafted. <laughs> no, he was already going to be drafted. If he does something in the preseason, people will jump on him. He did last year. That's exactly, exactly what he did. On. <laughs> yeah, they did. But I, they already had reports. Uh, I don't know if you guys read it, but I'm an Eagles fan myself, so I'm always up to date on what they're doing in training camp. And apparently, Jordan Matthews was being interviewed, and I guess news came out that Nelson Aguilar was going to be taking his spot in the slot, and he was running with the first team reps. Jordan Matthews went out and de- denied it. He said that it means nothing. Don't read into it. And that the person who said it basically doesn't know what they're talking about. Three days later, I saw that boom, drops Mike. <laughs> Pretty but funny, I, huh? Yeah. That's more to do with maybe they knew they were going to trade him. Because there's been reports the whole offseason that he was going somewhere. Yeah. So maybe they were given the reps because they're like, all right, we're close to a deal. We need to actually start playing the guy who's actually going to play the slot. Maybe maybe that's more it than him yeah. actually being better. My thing is just oh, like... Yeah, I don't think he's better by any means. I don't know. I, can, I don't think I'll ever waste a pick on Aguilar. Pro Football Focus <laughs> literally rated him the worst wide receiver of the last two years. I can't get behind Aguilar. He will be on zero of my teams. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What's funny, though, you said everyone knows last year Nelson Aguilar was really bad with drops, right? Mm-hmm. And he was rated so bad. And everybody knows this, and everybody dislikes him for that reason. But Quincy Anunua, I know he's done now, but he has actually led the league in highest drop percentage. But everybody wanted to own him up until that, so I, I can't make any sense of it. I was, was never interested. There. I think Crabtree was second. You know yeah, what it is. Was. You know what it is. And I was arguing with someone about this. You know, drops aren't like that big of a deal in fantasy, and in, in terms of like what your production is going to end up being. But I think it depends on like the type of player, because you have a guy like Will Fuller, right? Like, obviously, he's out for, for a couple months. But he, coming out of college, like, he had big concerns about, you know, catching the ball, dropping the ball. And, like, five of his drops might be compar- comparable to, like, a, a Crabtree's 12 drops. Because, you know, a drop on, like, a, an eight-yard slant is not the same. It's not going to do the same thing as, as Will Fuller dropping a 40-yard deep ball. So, like, I don't know. Drop, looking too deep into, into drop passes, I feel like, could be a bad thing if you're just looking at it from, like, a bird's eye view and only looking at the number rather than, like, what kind of targets they are. Yeah, well, and it's more for the game, too. Like, if you watch a game and someone has, like, two drops early, you can pretty much bank on the fact that they're not going to be targeted for the rest of the game very heavily, depending on who they are, obviously. But typically, if you're dropping multiple passes, you're not an elite wide receiver anyways. So... I think it's more of a game by game thing, and like if you have so many drops, it's also likely that you're being heavily targeted, which means from a football perspective, you might not be as good. But fantasy, like you can drop 20 passes if you're getting 200 catches. Like I don't care at all. Players that year over year have a bad drop rate. The only one who I'm rolling the dice on this year is Martavis Bryant. Oh yeah, just because that guy is such an animal. We got to get into him. Okay, I think the last person that we should probably even talk about. Because we have everyone else at the end like relatively the same. Yeah. It's not really worth talking about. I think the big one's Pierre Garçon. Oh, wait. Let's talk about... Uh, um, nine uh, spots behind us. Also... But so- also, a disclaimer for that is that we are PPR, and he's definitely 100% better in PPR than in standard. Yeah. Like, he's going to get like three touchdowns. Yeah, we'll do Garçon, and then we got to get back to Martavis Bryant again, because I, I cut out before. So, yeah, I mean, my thing with Garçon, I definitely don't dislike him. I think he's like... I just think everybody thinks he's like a sleeper and a breakout candidate to the point where I'm not sure he's really going to return that much value because, you know, it, it, the storyline is pretty obvious. You know, him him reuniting with Kyle Shanahan. He had such a great year as the ex receiver back in, in Washington. But I just look at this San Francisco, like, offense as a whole. And I'm like, and it's kind of the same situation with, like, Carlos Hyde or, like, when the Joe Mil- Williams buzz was around. It's like, Whoever takes control of that number one spot, good for you if you have the guy, but how much value is he really going to give you? You know what I mean? In an offense that is just not just not good. I it's guess only it's only PPR for me. I can't touch him in standing. Because he's literally they're not gonna score many. And if they score it's gonna be high. So what what value does he have in a standard score league when it's only touchdowns that count? But in PPR, I mean, who else are they gonna throw to? Yeah. So could he see 
could he be in the top 10 in targets? Like, I guess, and he's going in the eighth round in PPR, so, I mean, I'll take a shot on that. Yeah, I hear you. It's not it's not anything that I, like, dislike him. It's just, for me, it's kind of like a blah. Like, I, I don't really... I don't really want him because I don't. I don't really see much upside there. I just I, I could see like something that we never thought of happening. Kind of like they signed like, like Marcus Wilson and uh, Aldrick Robinson's coming over from Atlanta with Kyle Shanahan. Like something weird happening where Pierre Garcon like the storyline doesn't just like match up perfectly where he sees a million targets and, and it's just like a monster because. I don't know. Like he, he's shown the glimpses, but I'm just—I don't really have a logical, a logical argument here, to be honest. I just don't want Garcon that bad. Well, I can kind of make a make a little point with Garcon here on why I haven't been getting him. Uh, he is a PPR guy, and he's pretty solid in that aspect, and should have a good season. But when I'm still there, he is climbing up to the point where there's just other guys around him that I, I would never take Garcon over. So it's—I haven't—I've yet to draft him in a month. But not, that's not to say I would, but when there's a deciding factor being on the 49ers, exactly. there's other players. That's I'd what I mean. Like his, his ADP is rising too much for me. I'm looking at, like, pass attempts last year. You know, he's going over from a team where, you know, he, he went over 1,000 yards, but he's also he was also playing with Kirk Cousins, who, who had, like, 4,900 yards. They averaged 38 pass attempts per game. The 49ers averaged just over 30. So they're going to lose a lot of volume in terms of just passing opportunity there. While he might get a, a much bigger market share, of course. But, you know, like you said, the scoring opportunities won't really be there. Definitely a better PPR all around play. But I it's just I think he's just rising up draft boards too much to the point where he's not really giving you that much room of value if you do draft if him. If he hits the six, like late six, early seven, that's probably where I'm going to be like, no. But I think if he stays where he's at in eight, mm-hmm. I'll do that. But if he rises a little bit further, which honestly, he probably will, then I'm not going to touch that. What about, um, I didn't even notice this one because we were actually so close. We both have Edelman significantly lower <laughs> than the community does. And I'm a Patriots fan. And just like my take is that you've already got Gronk, Cook, everyone. And I think they're going to try and, if Mitchell can stay healthy, I think they're going to try and have Mitchell fill the one. But even if he doesn't, they have Hogan and Amendola, and it's like, where do you see 90 receptions on top of that? So I can't draft, I get to draft him in a mock draft. Like, do, do you have, would you ever draft Edelman? I mean, where he's going, I like off to, because he, he's still going to be that slot guy. I mean, obviously they bring in Cooks, but Cooks has played more on the outside. He was always like a 70% snap guy on the outside. Edelman's more of like a 60% slot guy. So... I don't. His role's not going to change. It's just the fact that the targets, of course, with Gronk coming back healthy, they brought in Dwayne Allen to, you know, I guess lessen the hurt of losing Bennett. N- not a big deal, really, in any kind of PPR format. But um, nonetheless, yeah, they have other weapons that are definitely useful. And I just think that, like, if you're going to take a shot on a New England guy, for me, I like Cooks this year. Um, I mean, Gronk is a, a great value where he's going because he's getting he's getting picked around and a half later than he's been for the last five years. But he's literally basically providing you with the same risk he has for the last five years as well. Um, but with, with Edelman, yeah, I, it, the targets are going to fall off, and therefore, like, it's just, it's a linear effect. You know, the targets, receptions, PPR numbers are just going to go down. So, And his floor is not great either, because the other guys on the team that they added in terms of uh, Cooks and getting Gronk back, those guys have the high ceiling. So there is going to be players with big games on the Patriots. It's way more likely to be one of those guys. And it's not even just the target still decline. Like, he's declining. Like, he's not as good right. as he's been. I even watch the Super Bowl. Like, that's – obviously, I watch every Patriots game. But most of you guys watch the Super Bowl. Like, he's not as good as he used to be. He's dropping a lot of passes. He's not getting the same separation, at least for me. So, I'm not – I don't know. I'm never never going to have him. I was – I was shocked they uh, re-signed him this offseason because I was like, oh, they bring in Cooks. Well, he's not a slot receiver. I mean, once Julian Edelman's off the Patriots next year, like, you know, he could do something. Or they got the – did you see that kid Austin Carr with that catch in the back of the end zone yesterday? Yeah, that was nice. You yeah. play him in DraftKings like I did. Yeah, yeah. He could be a preseason hero. And that's why I was like, you know, like the Patriots are always so good at just kind of filling that slot. Like you just kind of really need an athletic guy who's technically sound. So them re-signing Edelman to me was like, wow, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little surprised here with that. It's because he's Edelman, yeah. and the fans love him. So I think it's just like, he's Edelman. We're not paying him that much. He's going to fill the slot, so let's just keep him. Brady likes him. They're like best friends. So True. They'll probably go uh, out together. It's a good football move. 
Them two are gonna like walk off into the sunset holding hands. Brady and Edelman. What else we got here? We got anyone else? Martavis. Martavis. This, is Martavis. Right. Martavis. this is another one where it's tricky to grasp because it's just, you know, everyone, it's a storyline's kind of the same for everyone. It's just like, you know, he's an elite talent, but you know, there's a lot of baggage that comes with him off, off the field and on the field, I guess. But it, for me, there's just too many question marks for where he's being drafted. And I feel like his ADP is gonna continually rise. And that's why I'm kind of staying away because you have guys like Crabtree and then you have Fitz, who I love, I already told you, going after him. So I would never take a Martavis over that. What I would say, though, just a quick side note for anyone that's like kind of nervous about other players on the Steelers, I was looking at splits and pretty much every single player, like skill player, Antonio Brown, Le'Veon Bell, Ben Roethlisberger, is way better actually with Bryant on the field than without him. But Bryant as a whole, I don't know. I can't like... I I think I'm just too scared. Like, I don't have a logical argument again here. I'm just kind of too nervous to have him as my wide receiver, too. Yeah, I think the case for him was how terrible Sammy Coates was last year. And no one pushed him, really, until he got hurt. Mm -hmm. And they were still targeting him. And so it's like, well, we all know Mark Havens Bryant's infinitely better than Coates. And so you'd think that he's going to be great. But I agree. I There's no way in the PPR league. And Sandy, you can convince me until I look at his ADP. And especially, like, if you think Kelvin Benjamin's ADP is going to rise in the preseason, he does good, just imagine ADR touchdown I know. on, like, the first drive from Martavis Bryant. Yep. It's a whole round ahead. Yeah, that's fine yeah, with I'm me. Pr- I'm praying that doesn't happen. I'm the highest for sure out of you three because it comes down to just watching him play. I, I am sure 100% that if he does not resign, if, as long as he avoids trouble, right, and he remains in the league, he doesn't re-sign with the Pittsburgh Steelers. He's going to be a one somewhere. He will be, and even if he's not immediately placed in that role, he will eventually get that role because he's that kind of talent. The dude's huge. He's built like it. The only reason he's not is because Antonio Brown's there. No one else can match his speed. I even am not really too concerned with um, his off-the-field issues. Most of these other guys who get in this kind of trouble, you see them all the time time in the media in the news so and so did this this guy was coaching kids this guy was doing programs um doing charity work like he was actually doing really cool stuff and posting hella workout videos all the time motivational stuff always whenever asked talked about his commitment to staying back in the league and getting back into the league so yeah it's a risk because he's already been there once and you know especially right now it seems like everyone's getting suspended all the time for less and less stuff um, I'm just not too worried about it, and I think that the talent, it, I don't want to draft him as early as he's going because he used to be a better value, and I'm biased now, and I want that value, but yeah. I really think he's going to be a back and wide receiver, too, at the worst. I, I think I'm just being lazy here, to be honest with you. I think I just don't want to draft him because I don't want to have to worry about all the shit, but in reality, like I'm sure he'll be fine. He'll be reinstated. He's not going to be suspended. And he'll end up playing, which is what I should really be looking at, I guess, when I'm when I'm projecting him into the season. But it's just like a, a lot of a lot of shit you've had to deal with, I guess, if you are a Martavis Bryant owner. Um, to that point, though, you, you know, you said like he won't, he would be a one someone else uh, somewhere else. I'm gonna check stats real uh, splits real quick and see if if he's ever played games without Antonio, because you know if you have Antonio Brown yeah, on the side right. and and why Antonio Brown probably. Um, perform so much better with Martavis is that them two together are like a ridiculous duo so you can't you can't cheat one way or the other that's why Brown's numbers go up but let me see I don't think he has because Brown, Brown always plays yeah, so yeah it would only be a game that Brown sat and I think they would have also sat Bryant that and is it would true. only be a one game sample zero games can't really tell us anything zero games but it's just, the, it's the, just the ADP yep. like he's going yeah. in the fourth round on fantasy football calculator mm-hmm. ahead of like Crabtree Jarvis Benjamin Tate Larry Snit, uh, Sneed, Crowder, Diggs, Emmanuel, like all of them. Yep. And it's just like, I don't know, like rounds ahead of some of them. Yeah, that's that's also like what I hate about, you know, like you and me, like our channel, we've been on fantasy football for a while now, like a couple months, right? So when you start the summer, you see guys and you're like, yep, those are my guys. And then when it hits around this time, people start drafting the ADPs drop, just like you said about Martavis, and you're like, God damn it, I want, I want 65 overall Martavis Bryant, not 45 overall. And there you're like, uh, I don't even know if he's like a good value anymore, and you, you kind of get iffy in that in that range, you know? Yeah, the, the old Mixon thing. I drafted Mixon in a mock in the ninth round Jesus earlier Christ. this year, <laughs> and now if you take him in the third round, I'm like, huh? Yeah, <laughs> that's dude. six rounds different. Crazy. It feels different too. 
Yeah, that happened so many. My first sleeper video this summer was was Mike Gillisley. He was going all his ADP was like 104. I was like, okay. When you're deciding who you take, and the player I'm talking about is Tyreek Hill, and you're on, and he's on the board, mm-hmm. and you're deciding, do I want to take Tyreek Hill or do I want to take this other player? Where do you see yourself pulling the trigger on Hill? I always can find more prototypical receivers. I'd rather go with it in that position in the draft. He is quickly rising up my draft board, um, quickly going off the ranks. And it was because I did a video specifically on him a few weeks ago, and I found out a bunch of stuff that I didn't, not that I didn't know, but I, I just, I felt like people were kind of blowing over him just because they were like, oh, there's no way he could do it again next year with the uh, ridiculous efficiency. But you look back at Macklin wasn't playing, and Hill was so involved in that passing offense. So I, I, I think I've moved him up to like wide receiver 16 at this point. And, you know, people, like you said, you don't like the prototypical build of Hill, but we've seen, you know, it's a trend in the recent years that you see guys like Antonio Brown, Odell Beckham. Yeah, Antonio Brown's the biggest call. Very, yeah, very similar uh, build. So it's not, it's not out of the question that they could be the number one. But, I mean, obviously you don't, you don't like it, but what I found cool was that he was targeted inside the 10 just as much as Kelsey was. So it tells you that he probably moves just as well as Antonio Brown does. When you look at, um, I don't know if you guys ever check into Matt Harmon's reception perception, when he uh, basically breaks down, he'll, he'll pick a wide receiver and then he'll watch all their tape. And then he'll say like the success uh, that that receiver had on like a technical level, like uh, versus on the slant, on the, on the corner, um, on, on a flat or whatever, whatever routes. And then against press coverage, zone coverage, whatever. And Terry Kill just rated off the charts. So it tells me he's like super technically sound. He gets utilized a lot in the red zone. And I get that he's not gonna be on like special teams and he's not gonna be rushing the ball anymore. But I, I think you put together just how good he actually is as a player, plus the reports of him being like crazy good in camp and, uh, and just how good he played without Macklin as the number one um, last year. The only thing I would be concerned about is that obviously teams are going to game plan against him. Where I feel, and, and Nick can go in after this and let me know his thoughts, but without a doubt, he's going to be the focal point of that offense. I just think, like you said, the defense is keen on him, and having a year of tape really isn't going to help him, but the kind of similar with Michael Thomas, um, it's going to kind of be negated by his increased market share. Uh, but I still do project him potentially at double-digit targets. I don't think that would be um, a stretch by any means. He could even reach his 12 touchdowns again because he may run it in and he can just break away at any point. But I think some games he just won't see the yardage. He won't get, you know, 100 yards very often. I don't. I think he only had over 80 yards in two games last season. Uh, I think it's the the touchdowns for me. I don't remember how many he had last year. It was like. 10 or 12 or something. Six but receiving. I'm pretty sure like six of them are receiving. Six receiving, and, three rushing, and yeah. I think maybe two or three return. Yeah, so 12. Yeah, half so you receiving. take out the return. Can we really project him to get three rushing touchdowns? I mean, maybe. But like Alex Smith had a season where he threw zero touchdowns to a wide receiver. <laughs> so it, he just doesn't look good. Like that. You, watch, you watch those games, and he's wide open deep. But Smith's just not even looking. And maybe he looks this year because he watches the tape and he sees how good that he is, but I just don't have a lot of faith in Smith to where I'm going to spend a fourth-round pick on Tyreek Hill because he's going to see touchdown regression. There's absolutely no way he doesn't go down in that department, especially not returning. I, I think, do you guys know, Like, I'm pretty sure he's not returning punts or kickoffs. He, he kick kick for sure. Yeah, exactly. kickoffs for sure. I think punts. they're only using him in like very specific situations, so you could pretty much knock him off. Um, like the, the game's on the line, Tyree Kill goes out there. But other than that, he's not going to be returning those things. So you take those touchdowns off, and he, like Darren said, like he's not going to be ten for 150. Like I know that that's a big projection, but like, he's not going to be the yardage guy. And if I'm taking off touchdowns, and his yardage is never going to be that high, then I'm not. I don't want to take him in the same range of Alshon and Devonta Adams and Crabtree and uh, Allen Robinson. Yeah, I want to wait further than that because I think he's a lot closer to the guys I like, like the Tate, the Diggs, the Snead, the Crowder. I think he's very, very close to them, but he's going a round and a half to two rounds ahead of them. So I don't see myself getting him. Like, he's great. I'm not going to argue the talent. Like, you watch him play and you're like, this kid's awesome. Like, he's really good. I just can't spend that high of a pick on him. I, I mean, I hear you, especially Alex Smith. Kind of, I hate that he's the quarterback because he's not. I mean, the reports saying he's taking more deep chances down the field. Maybe he's uh, feeling a little, little pressure from their first round pick, Mahomes. Um, 
who I think might future future uh, I think Mahomes in two years with him and Kelsey. Oh my god, I love that. But dude, my thing is like Hill. He was that guy though. He is the guy that can put up those big yardage numbers with Macklin out of the game. I was like, I know it's stupid to go off the sample size. It's only four games, but his targets went from like four to eight and a half. His receptions went from two and a half to seven. Um, and when you like prorate everything out to the year, you could take out all the rushing numbers. You could take out all the special teams, rushing touchdowns, all that stuff. And if you go from the four games that he played without Macklin, he ends up as wide receiver 12 in PPR. And I know that's like a very, it's, it's stupid to take a sample size that small and kind of parade it out. But I just think that's, it's almost like kind of realistic for me because he, he's getting way more, he's going to be getting way more opportunity without Macklin. But that's also what Diggs did in, on a per game basis is 13. Good point. Two rounds later. But now, but Diggs are, has other weapons there, really. Tyreek Hill's the only number one. It's been like yeah, kind I mean, of, I'm not too high. I think Thielen's good, but yeah. he's not. Rudolph is the only thing for me that that limits the upside in the touchdown department, but that's never really been Diggs' forte anyway. Right, and Terry Kill, like I said, he, he is pretty involved in that pass game, and it, that tells me either one, they're you know they're drawing up plays for Hill, or two, he works really well in tight spaces, very similar to a guy like Antonio Brown, and therefore like the quarterback is targeting you because you're able to create space in such a small part of the field, you know? Yeah, so I don't have a team's turn out either, because I'm not typi- it's typically my two for wide receiver. At that range, because I've probably got two running backs in the first three, mm-hmm. so I don't. I just don't like him as my two. Like he might flex. He's a flex. For me, I was split, but if I had to, if I had to choose, I feel like everyone's kind of black and white on him. It's either like he's the greatest, or he's just going to be like no way he comes anywhere near to what he was doing last year. And I'm kind of leaning towards the uh, the former on that. What about uh, Chris Conley? He's their number two. He's like no one's talking about the number two in this offense. Oh man, are you serious? You're, this is a joke, right? Absolutely. Well, t- tell me this. Tell, <laughs> tell me this. Good size, right? But you got Alex Smith throwing the ball. What happened? This is an absurd fucking play-by-play here. But Chris Conley, great downfield guy, like four three five forty, big, like six two, two twenty, two fifteen. Mahomes comes in with that cannon arm. Chris Conley's gonna be a full-time starter. He's gonna be playing every single down. Like I, I, I understand this is like such a late reach, but I feel like it's worth mentioning for people in deeper leagues because Chris Conley's the second wide receiver in this offense, and literally there's no buzz about him. Deep, Nick, deep leagues. Nick yeah. did a mock draft for a thirty-team league. I think he would have considered him in that one, but <laughs> yeah, that was a bad okay. draft. <laughs> Whatever. When no, Con- not interested. Not worth my time. In sixteen. Yeah, but like, what about was it Wilson? Is he still on the team? Uh, Albert know. Wilson. Yeah, but he he sucks. Yes, but I don't think Conley's that good either. So, <laughs> yes, well, we don't know. You don't know what you're talking about. Alex Smith is a quarterback. And I don't. That's the thing. I don't. I think Alex Smith will be the quarterback the whole year, yeah. which means I don't want the wide receiver too. That is like true. what upside does that give me? No, it doesn't. But I just it's just like a full time starter. Like you could do worse than someone who's going to be a full time starter. You know, in a deeper league. Yeah, I just think there are just so many guys late that it's just not worth it. Like there in a twelve team league, he's not draftable. In a fourteen, you can start considering it. But I think six teams where. Everyone is draftable at that point. Wait till the week one hits and he pulls <laughs> to Calvin Benjamin and Marvin Jones, and then hell yeah, and then everyone's so commenting on your YouTube videos. Week one, you can guarantee you that people will be hating. Yeah. On the why didn't you tell me about this kid? He's the number two. You stupid. <laughs> we can wrap it up here. That's a wrap. All right, I cut it off there. Um, we talked a little bit more, but it was kind of unimportant stuff. Um, but that was basically the end of the ranking. So let me let me know. Let me know if you guys want this. For during the season, if you don't like Nick for some reason, I don't know. I don't know why you wouldn't. But if you don't want him, let me know. I guess. But I think having three people in this podcast will be better. And let me know. I guess in the off season, if you guys want us to do another one of these, um, let me know the topic. We could do running back or something. We could do news. I don't, I don't know what. Let me know what you guys want in the comment section below. And if you want it all, but that is the end of this video. And thanks for watching.